Hello, everyone. This is Andrew Blumstrom, along with Amanda Fulbright, and you are listening to ABA Unfiltered, where each episode we interview guests from around the world of ABA. Whether you're a BCBA, RBT, or just interested in ABA, you are sure to pick up some actionable advice you can utilize on your journey. In today's episode, we are joined by Jason Owen, President and CEO of Blue Sprig Pediatrics. Andrew, you excited for episode two? I am. I'm very excited for episode two. I think episode one went really well. It was great to talk to Tim and excited to talk to Jason in this episode and kind of hear about his journey at Blue Sprig so far. Yeah, I'm excited to hear about how his experience in healthcare, where you know he came from last before joining Blue Sprig and joining the uh, uh, big world of ABA, I, I'm really excited to hear about things that are the same and things that are different and, and really just how his experience has been. And maybe we'll even get a prediction for where we're going out of him. Yeah. You ready to do this? I am. I'm very ready to do this. All right. Let's do it. All right. Now, without further ado, we would like to welcome our guest, Jason Owen. Why don't you start by telling the listeners a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much. Uh, like you said, my name is Jason Owen. I am privileged to be the president and CEO of uh, Blue Sprig. Uh, I've been here almost a year. I think we close in on a year at the end of this month. Uh, time flies. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to continue to learn about the industry and uh, bring a little bit of my background uh, to the industry. I've been in healthcare services for about 25 years and before that in healthcare investment banking. So healthcare services is all I've ever known. Very nice. Excited to be here. It's exciting. Excited to have you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Jason. I'm really excited to have you. So like you said, you've been with Blue Sprig in, in the ABA world for about a year now. So what's different about ABA than the other healthcare spaces that you've been in in the past? I'd say what's different and what's the same. What's different is, um, I think, the level of optimism we have with our clients and our clients' futures. Um, I come out of pediatric home care, geriatric home care, hospice, and that's clearly a different outlook on, on those clients. When I walk into a center, when I talk to our BCBAs, when I talk to our RBTs, everyone has an amazing amount of optimism for what tomorrow, next week, next month holds. And I think it's just naturally motivating. Um, like you know, every other industry, that has to do with staffing and, and individuals and training and and getting people to do the right thing all the time. It's it's stressful and, and challenging, but I think when you're rooted in optimism, it makes it a lot easier. Has anything really surprised you about the ABA field that you weren't expecting? I, I don't know if it's the ABA field or the time during COVID that I came into the space, but I, I would say with the um, high turnover rate the high attrition rate of our employees, that's been a little bit surprising. It, it's been higher in this industry than I've dealt with in other industries, but I don't really know if it's because of where we were in the evolution of COVID, where we were in the evolution of quiet quitting and uh, you know w- workforce retention challenges, uh, but that's probably my biggest challenge and, and surprise so far. Awesome. And you kind of just- bring- and if- Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you kind of briefly just talked about this, but uh, turnover has been a very big issue for many industries recently. Uh, but with ABA, it seems to be a little bit of a, a bigger issue, um, even before the great resignation. Um, do you have any like lesson learned from your experiences that we can apply within the ABA field that you've learned in your previous experiences in the healthcare industry? Yeah, when we look and compartmentalize who we employ, we employ a lot of people between the age of 18 and 25. And I think the the needs of that group, um, the, what fulfills them, what challenges them, expectations they have is, is different than some other groups. Um, a lot of Home care is is delivered by nurses in the twilight of their career, as opposed to, you know, first career or first job. And, and I think we've done a lot of study around what's important. I think we've learned that near term incentive, uh, both financial and development, are extremely important. 
I think understanding their why, listening to their voice, answering their challenges, uh, being responsible and accountable um, to, to their needs, I, I think is very important. And if you run this business exactly how you've run other businesses, it's just not going to be a good fit. Um, I, I, I've talked to a lot of RBTs and a lot of BCBAs um, in the first year. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot of things, uh, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And as we've evolved and changed how we select individuals, how we train individuals uh, with, uh, you know, the, the first 30 days that they're on board, how we ask for feedback, um, how we incentivize work and productivity. I think all of those have changed this year and they've resulted from you know, this research and, and, and these conversations. Awesome. So there, are shifting gears a little bit, but still staying in the ABA field, uh, there were uh, a number of shakeups in, in ABA businesses in 2022. We had, you know, um, businesses that were closing locations or, or, you know, laying off staff and, and and all host of other things like that, and you just see them on LinkedIn repeatedly if you yeah. if you're following these spaces, right? We so, <laughs> so if you could maybe kind of give your perspective on that, and do you have any predictions for for where it's heading this year? You know, there's in addition to that question, I'll add another piece. I think there's also interesting debate, dialogue, criticism. Frame it how you want. Uh, businesses that are independently owned or businesses that are um, owned by larger professional investment firms. Um, and I think there's a lot of lot of analysis between the two. I actually don't think there is that significant of a difference between how we're um, you know owned the structure or who. I think it has to do with capacity, efficiency. Um, at the end of the day, Healthcare in the United States is a for-profit business. And when I say for-profit, I mean it, it takes an individual that is willing to accept risk to sign a lease, to hire employees, to pay for those employees, to provide healthcare insurance. And the return is the, the billable hours that they're able to submit to payers. And hopefully at, at the end of the month, the year, they've billed more than they've spent. And in this industry, I think by and large, people are spending more than they're able to bill. And when you continue that math for a prolonged period of time, five, six years, and in most of the cases, I think a lot of the owners get to a place where they're not willing to continue to write checks to operate. So these businesses, when you think about the evolution, 2015, 2016, really up, up and through 2020, there were a lot of acquisitions. A lot of people wanted to sell to private equity. A lot of people did sell to private equity. Um, there's a lot of original owners that that made a fair amount of money selling to private equity. And I think a lot of the investment thesis from the private equity firms were um, buy a few businesses, um, create efficiencies with uh, the corporate spend, and grow organically uh, to be able to you know pay back the investment. Unfortunately, 2020 happened, and I think COVID slowed down a lot of growth, especially with center-based businesses. Um, people did not necessarily want to put their child in a center with 20 other children and 17 employees uh, and have close contact exposures. I think as we've evolved through 2020, 21, and, and finally into 23, we're starting to see life to get back to normal and expectations around proximity uh, to be accepted. Uh, and, and I think the next five years is going to be a lot different than the last five years. But we do have a lot of owners that are sitting here not wanting to write additional checks to continue to operate. Um, a lot of people couch it as corporate greed or, you know, they just they want to make their money before everybody else makes their money. But but most businesses in the ABA space don't make any money. So there isn't any profiteering um, and, and people are just trying to figure out what's next. Uh, I think our business is, is in a, a place where we are stable. We're trying to figure out how we can provide the most efficient uh, spend with the highest quality care. And the industry itself, I don't think, has really created standards around 
How many supervisors should you have? How many area managers should you have? How many people does it take to bill and collect for the service? And, and those are the pieces we're still trying to figure out. Thank you for that detailed uh, answer. You know, as it's, a- It's top uh, of mind, Amanda, sorry. Yeah, of it's, course, it's right of there. Course. Yeah. You know, um, I know that you you have kids that are, you know, juniors in high school and thinking about careers and next steps, um, as do I. And, uh, you know, my daughter being a, a daughter of two behavior analysts, right, uh, you know, is very interested in that career. And I'm right. sitting here looking at the the field right now and going, <laughs> is that is that a smart investment in your future right now. Um, and that's a sad place for me to be as a behavior analyst and as somebody that's touched the lives of many, many children and families. But, you know, thinking about my daughter, do you want to send her down that path when, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what the next 10 years holds for us. And that's a scary and sad place to be. What are your thoughts? I, I would say the next 10 years for a 16 year old are frightening. Like forget yeah. about, forget about ABA, you know, being Fair. in a father of a 16 and year old girl and boy, um, a lot's going to happen, right? You know, we're touring colleges. We're trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. Um, but going back to, to ABA specifically, one of the reasons that I looked or sought out an opportunity in ABA was specifically for the the demand side of 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 the business equation there are more kids being diagnosed every year on the spectrum um and and that's not slowing down whether it's environmental what whether it's better diagnostics it, it continues to increase so fundamentally speaking the patients are continuing to grow um the I think there is a bit of a population boom as well. You know, there are, are more people having more kids within their family. So there's more kiddos, you know, at, at a higher probability that, that will need our services. So I'm not scared about the number of clients dwindling or the number of people that need care to go down. So then you look at how do we provide that care? Um, and I think there are people that continue to invest in their career to, to pay for university and, and, you know, to work it during the day and go to school at night and achieve their certificates and become interns. I mean, it's, it seems very vibrant and healthy within our organization, as well as, you know, other organizations that, that, you know, compete in this space. I think the part that is most scary to me is one statistic. If you look, if you take a sample of every practicing BCBA right now, less than 50% have been employed for five years or more. So this industry, this space, this certificate, this graduate program, this science has been around for more than five years, more than 10 years. And when you think about only 50% or 50% of the people have been in this industry for zero to five years, it means there's a high burnout factor. It means a lot of people are choosing to leave the space. Um, and that's that's the question we have to answer. If people dedicate their education dollars and their energy around achieving this certificate to treat this very needy needing, excuse me, population, um, then what happens in four years? What happens in five years? What happens in ten years? Um, th that's the question I want to answer, Amanda. And I think if we answer that question. And I think it has to do with work-life balance. I think it has to do with um, meeting the needs of, of the individuals that are treating um, the, the kids in, in our service area. Um, when you spend time in a center during the day, there are amazing moments. There are high stress moments. And I think the, the you know, roller coaster of emotions goes up and down depending on which hour you're sitting in. And I do think it can be taxing. Um, and then you throw in all of the other healthcare regulation that, that affects every healthcare company, the amount of you know, um, compliance, the amount of documentation, the you know, healthcare authorizations, billing, collecting, all of those opportunities to, to have to do work that's not productive. I think weighs on people and uh, you know, th this space gives you a, a great education 
um, that's transferable to other spaces. We just got to figure out how to keep people motivated to stay in the space. Mm -hmm. I know a number of behavior analysts that that like I graduated with or around the same time, and they a number of them have left the ABA field yeah. altogether. Um, and even more of them might be in some sort of related position, but are not right. providing services to families and clients. I am one of them. Right. You know, I run the training department, but right. I do not provide services to kids or families. Yeah. And going back to the statistic I quoted, you're you would not be in that because you're not currently billing for services. Mm -hmm. You're still very much productive within an ABA company, but but you've evolved to a position that's of great need. And I think that's part of it too. In order to continue to evolve businesses, we need people in your position mm -hmm. doing the work that you're doing. Um, and, and maybe if, if the ranks of those positions starts to mature, there'll be fewer opportunities for people to leave clinical work directly with clients and, and maybe it'll subside and we can blend that with some work-life balance, some opportunities to do projects, some opportunities to, to not have to be in a center 40 hours a week. I think all of those things will help. Wow. We're along for the ride. Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, a, a word that I keep hearing, um, I heard it a lot in 2022, more than ever before, um, value-based purchasing is that the correct term sure. um is this a yeah. is this a buzzword is this is this real like what can you tell us about that and what what do you think about how that might affect our businesses moving forward value-based purchasing is a construct around a insurance payment model and it, it started um, with hospitals decades ago and it, it's evolving into services uh, simply put, payers want to um, provide additional reimbursement for service providers that excel um, above average. And, and they want to do the opposite. They want to provide some sort of discount or uh, financial penalty for, for providers that are below average. Um, that, that's a basic construct of what it is. Um, when, when you're looking at very mature, very defined industries like hospitalization, long-term care, home care, it, it's very easy to find industry norms to benchmark what is considered good, great, average, poor, bad. In this industry, I, I don't know that we have um, defined key performance indicators that would be able on a relative scale to rank sort providers. So I think the first thing our industry needs to do is establish a benchmarking system that uh, everyone adopts to say, these this is the gold standard and this is not. Uh, so until we get there, I think there's gonna be opportunity to, to provide some level of um, you know, indicator to a payer whether it's um, you know number of hours provided versus authorized hours, uh, that could be a very basic indicator. Uh, and, and you could say, if, if I achieve this more, there's a premium payment. If I fall below that, then there's a there's a discount that that you'll take. Um, you know, you could look at the number of family guidance hours. You could look at uh, time to admit a qualified patient. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of things we could look at. Uh, but I, I would, until there's an industry standard, I don't think it's going to be widely negotiated, nor be a, a large part of our reimbursement um, system. Do you think that industry standard is kind of up for the taking for an industry leader to help establish, or do you think it's going to come from uh, payers, insurance companies, or like where do you see that coming from? I think the larger providers will have the opportunity um, to have a voice within the larger payers. And if we think about industry associations, I think that's a great place to start. That is the voice of many. If you if you can create a, um, a, a central voice that everyone agrees with through some you know, some industry organization, I, I think that will help. Um, but I do think the payers will have uh, the majority of the say 
on what they think is important because a payer really looks at outcomes and, and they look at if I'm paying you for this service, what benefit is it providing our clients and how do we measure that and what do we think is important? So I do think the maybe selection will come from the payers and the defined choices that the providers lock in on will probably come from either industry groups or larger providers. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I know, it, it, again, if our listeners have been following this space, they've probably seen that term, may not um, exactly know what that means or where we're, we're heading with that. So thanks for that explanation for our right. listeners. Yeah. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit um, into uh, a question that I have for you about the first few months that you were at Blue Sprig. You made some sizable investments in our training department, in, in my Andrews department, um, which is great. But tell us a little bit about why you did that and, and how you think training departments can help businesses or particularly ABA businesses be successful. The most shocking KPI that I saw the first couple of weeks I was here uh, was the the level of our turnover, especially with our, our RBTs. When when I really understood how many people were were leaving on an annual basis, the number was just unsustainable. Um, we were losing more people than we had employed on a, on an annual basis. And, and I looked at the leadership team and I said, we have to cut this in half. And so we started thinking about root causes of why people are leaving. And, and we came up with, with a couple of areas uh, that, that we thought were the main drivers for our turnover. First and foremost was training. We, we had 100 and I want to say 42 locations at, at the time I started. And I think we had 142 ways of training an RBT. Yeah. Um, we had some core curriculum. But the way it was administered, the way it was standardized, um, the way it progressed, the way it was emphasized uh, wasn't, well, you know, it was very haphazard. If you did it well, you did it well. And if you did it poorly, you did it poorly. And I think there was a, a range of experience for our RBTs. That was challenge one. Challenge two was our selection criteria. Uh, you know, how were we hiring candidates into this field? And, and quite frankly, 85% of all RBTs that we hire are hired as BTs that are new to the industry yeah. that we have to train. So look back to problem one, right? So, so we're bringing people in that had never been in the space before. And then third, uh, I'd say third and fourth, you know, they could be 3A and 3B or, or, or close fourth was compensation and leadership, local leadership at the center. So I challenged the company and I challenged you, Amanda, quite frankly, um, you know, how are we going to change this? Uh, you know, just to, to tell a story. Um, and this is, you know, Amanda, I, I met Amanda in, in Flower Mound uh, back in April, and we were going to talk about how we were going to assess and admit kids. You probably remember that as an agenda item. And I said, that's great, but let me, let me close that book. And let's talk about yeah. how can we train 40 to 50 RBTs a week? And, uh, here we are today. Um, we rolled out the pilot in July. We rolled out the rest of it, you know, Halloween day on October 31st. And currently every single BT that's hired in our company goes through an exhaustive discipline, standardized training. And I'm going to brag on you a little bit, Amanda. I mean, right now we have cut um, turnover, not quite in half, but by 40%. Um, the, the people that quit within 30 days is down 80%. Our success rate on passing the rbt exam is up it's you know, for a while you were quoting a hundred percent i think it's fallen all the way down to 97 and a half percent pass yeah. on the first try um and we've also looked at you know we've made investments in talent acquisition you know we we looked at you know who was successful as an rbt what is that personality type what are the traits they have so that's who we're selecting now and it's less about where you come from and what you've done. I think it's more about who you are and what your expectations are. And, and are you aware of exactly what we do? And reading exit interviews, I, I think, are very telling. And when you read exit interviews and people say, well, I, I didn't know I had to change a diaper. Well, clearly the interview process didn't go well. It, it wasn't informative. So someone took a job where they really didn't know what they'd be doing. So I, I think we've done a very good job investing in LPD. I'll take 
very little of the credit. You guys had to execute and you did. And, and here we sit today. Um, we invested in talent acquisition and, uh, you know, it, it's taken a little bit longer to hire and train and get everybody on board, but we're probably recruiting 90% of our needed BT and RBT openings from that group now. And, and I think the quality and efficiencies are getting better. Um, we've addressed how we pay people, how frequently we pay people, how we incentivize people. And, and now we're working on center level management uh, to make sure that, that they're making the fundamental core decisions every day to, to have people excited about coming back to work. Um, so that it's a long answer. Uh, and then that was probably my biggest surprise. It was the area that was glaring that needed investment. And here we sit today. Yeah. I was talking to a uh, a friend in, in a totally different space and and I was talking about the reduction in turnover and you know the main controlling variable during that time was the training. Yeah. And you know, her mind was kind of blown that training could possibly have that big of a, an effect on turnover. I, I am not an RBT. I have not sit, I have not, you know, gone through your training. Um I am not a BCBA, but you know, I've I've been in our centers for you know chunks of hours of days, and if you're not prepared how to anticipate or deal with certain behaviors, this job I think can be immensely stressful. Um, you would feel like a failure. You would feel stressed. Um, understanding how to adapt and modify and detract and uh, you know, change situations and behavior, I, I think is is core and key to keeping everybody um, kind of in a stable mindset and progressing through a treatment plan. And without that training, I don't, I'm surprised we didn't have higher turnover, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's, and I, I was an RBT before the credential was there, right. but I did the job, right? Right. And um, if I look back on, on all the years, those were the most stressful days. As an RBT, yeah. not as a BCBA, not as the yeah. the the training vice president, you know, none of that. It was when I was an RBT yeah. and when I was a new RBT, and yeah. I didn't know how to handle the nuanced situations or the left field situations yeah. that come at you. And it's just, man, hats off to RBTs, I, like yeah. they're the heroes of the company, right? They are the heroes of the company, and and you know, I I, I love that we've installed you know, self-paced promotional progressions, you know, as you, as you stick longer, you earn more, you, you earn more opportunity to, to climb the ladder. I mean, how many interns do we have right now? 185 currently? Yeah. Over 150, between 150 and 200. Yeah. At right. any given time. So, you know, it's just, it's continued opportunity. Um, and if, if they love the space and, and they love the energy and, and they, they understand what they're dealing with. I think it's a great space to be. So I'm gonna go all the way back to the question you asked me a little bit ago. Would I recommend it? Yeah, I would. Um, I actually have talked to my daughter about it. Um, you know, she's she's keen in on healthcare, probably a little bit of my influence, but you know, she's thinking about speech and, and, and language. She's thinking about you know pediatric therapy. She's thinking about this space. Um, so I I do think it's an amazing opportunity for for people as they enter their career. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I um, was watching a documentary recently about um, like the Victorian era era. And uh, they had uh, a person on there that was um, shoeing horses, a farrier. And and I don't I don't know that it's still the same um, amount of time. But on the show during the Victorian era, at least a farrier apprenticed for seven years before chewing horses and making their own horseshoes and I and I've I've sat on this I've chewed on this for weeks now right and I'm thinking are, are, horses are important shoes yeah. for horses are important I'm not discounting that at all but these are human children we're working with and right. our RBTs are getting you know 40 hours a week as a standard um, you know, our BCBAs are getting uh, 2000 experience hours as a standard, not saying right. that some don't go above and beyond, but it's it's mind blowing to me where we're at with our expectations on education and experience versus the responsibility that they have. Well, in fairness, they didn't have you in the Victorian era. So yeah. if they had you and your LPD team. I, I think they could cut, have cut that down quite a bit. Cut it, cut it in half. At least. At least. 
at least in half. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I want you to think back to, I think it was March, 2021. And when I, I think it was the first time I met you in person, Jason, 22. um, at, at 2022, March, sorry. March 22. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's only been, it's only yeah. been 11 and a half months. Yes. Yeah, um, so this was a, a large group meeting and you introduced the concept of wigs and, uh, and that was brand new term to me. Um, right. Can you tell us a little bit about what a wig is and how it might help guide an organization? Yeah, and I learned a lot that night about folks. Uh, you and I had 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 a conversation after dinner about changing people's behavior and the audacity of me to say that, especially sitting in that group. Do you remember that? I do. I remember right. it well. I was like, I'm either going to get fired or no, 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 no. my boldness. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but in fairness, they weren't my words. They were the author's words. So I'll, I'll go back. So so a wig is part of a business discipline called Four Disciplines of Execution. And and I, I'm not, I didn't write this. I don't take credit for it. I read the book once and, and I thought it was a very practical approach on, you know, effective change within an organization. Um, a lot of people talk about what to do. Very few people in business practice talk about how you actually change. And in this, this you can't pick this book up and say, oh, for ABA, you do this. What this book is, and it's for disciplines of execution, it really talks about identifying problems, identifying the root causes of those problems, identifying um, the, the actions you need to take to improve the outcome, and, and monitoring and measuring those and holding people accountable to do it that way every day. And you you use the word WIG, and it's basically an acronym for wildly important goal. Um, you think about a wildly important goal for us. Let's, let's talk about turnover. We're going to reduce our turnover by 50%. That is the wildly important goal. So in order to achieve that, um, you have to think about the lead measures that, that go into that goal. What things do we need to focus on that we can measure that that if we're successful, that we think will achieve that wildly important goal? And if you want to dissect this conversation, uh, standardized training, appropriate compensation, um, appropriate screening and hiring for uh, new BTs, RBTs. And then what things, what actions do you have to do in order to do that? Um, and so you take your your lead measures, you take your lag measures, they all focus on that wildly important goal. And hopefully, you know, at the end of the, the period of time that you said it's going to take us a year, it's going to take us nine months, you'll achieve it. But you know, in short, it, it's really just breaking down the components and steps of getting there into weekly or monthly components and keeping people focused on the progression and not necessarily the goal. And then when you when you achieve that wildly important goal, you've 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 accomplished a lot. You know, it's funny. I, a long time ago, uh, I was moving from one city to another, and we hired a truck. And there's a bunch of guys, and they were moving. And you know, when you when you start that process at seven in the morning, you think it's just this unbearable task. Like, how do you get this done? And this old guy that had been doing this for probably forty years looks at me and goes, "You know, it's like eating an elephant. Like, How's that?" He goes, "One bite at a time." Yeah, and you know. At the end of the day, the truck was loaded and, and they were out. And uh, here we are 11 and a half months later. Well, not since March, but, you know, 10 months since March. And and we're having success with reducing turnover. Um, so that's, and listen, I, I plagiarize every bit of it. Um, I, I read the book. I buy the book. I educate people on the book. Um, and, you know, it's funny. In my career, I've been in healthcare. My father has been in oil field services his whole life. And he actually introduced me to it. He ran a sales team in the oil field services space and said, this works for me. You should take a look. And that was probably 10 years ago. And uh, I brought it with me. And luckily, people listened. But the funny story was, so I, I, I introduced this in front of how many people were there? 50, 45, 50, 50 people? 50, yeah, yeah at least. Yeah. And, and I stood up and introduced the idea. And, and I showed a, a short three-minute video of the author um, that that created the, the strategies. And in that... He, he used the phrase, if you want to change people's behavior, and uh, that set off a firestorm with probably half the people sitting in the room, and Amanda and I talked about it that night. So, you know, whenever you're within an industry, open your ears, listen, um, you'll learn a lot, and I did. I was just watching out for you. 
Man, I appreciate just watching that. out for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Be, be careful telling behavior yeah. analysts that you're going to tell them how to change behavior. There's some egos Dennis, involved. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I hit play yeah, on a video. video. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, thank you, Jason, for, you know, this great conversation, this very honest uh, conversation that we've had today. Are you ready to play question of the week? Sure. Okay. And Do I have veto power away? on the question? I'm just kidding. You sure can. <laughs> yeah. I said no. Andrew said yes. Yeah, You're with right. Andrew, so I guess right. yes. So we've got three questions for you. Uh, the first one is, if you don't mind, and it doesn't have to be related to this field or healthcare, um, just if you could tell us something that you've learned lately. What have I learned lately? Um, let's go totally off script. And uh, I've learned that as I age and uh, my kiddos become more like adults, uh, I don't have to do as much for them. And I learned a very important lesson last weekend as we were unchristmasing our house that uh, my my son's back and shoulders are much stronger than mine. And I'm going to allow him to continue to uh, lift and do things so <laughs> so dad doesn't get hurt. So that that's one thing I learned in the last, uh, let's call it 72 hours. Yeah, I'm still so you're you you're know, embracing this. Mowing the yard. and <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm forced to embrace it because I sit here. I've got a heat wrap on my back because <laughs> I did something bad to myself on Sunday. So, yeah, I'm embracing it, literally. Okay, <laughs> got it. Being in the training world, we always like to le learn what others are learning out there. In That's the right. World. And then another question. So let's say you find yourself with an extra hour in your day. How would you spend it? So we're up to 25 hours a day now? You're up to 25 hours. Just one, but just yeah. one day. <laughs> just one day. Yeah. Um, I I do a lot of reading, whether it's business journals, social media. I, I stick, I, I spend a lot of time understanding who we are, where we're going. I would love to focus on reading for entertainment instead of knowledge for work or experience. Um, to be able to to disconnect completely. That's what I would do. Awesome. It is very nice to do that, to disconnect from the real world every once in a while. And I escape. think we too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now for the wheel. Uh oh. What I'm going to do here is in a second, I am going to pull up the wheel. Um, when I start it, what I'll need you to do is let me know when you would like to stop the wheel. Um, and whenever you stop, the number that it lands on will be the question that we will ask. So we will go ahead and fire up this wheel. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And then whenever you're ready for it to stop, go ahead and tell me to stop. It has to start first. Right? There we go. All right, stop. We Number are looking two. at question two. <clears throat> question two. What is your favorite travel destination or what is your dream location to travel? Oh. So I'm assuming most people in the audience have a bucket list of places yes. they they've they like to go or would like to go. So I, you know, if as I think about it, and I've had the, the luxury of taking some pretty cool trips. Um, my wife and I honeymooned in Thailand. That was fabulous. Um, and most recently I spent my summer vacation with my kids, my wife and my goddaughter in Cabo San Lucas. And that was the first time I had been there. Um, I, I tend to gravitate toward warm climates, um, but there's, there's a bunch of places I haven't gone um, let's say next on the list is probably the Amalfi Coast in Italy. I have never been to Italy. It's it's high on the list. Um, and uh, that's, that's, I think that's the answer, the Amalfi Coast. That's next on the list. Very have nice. you been? I have not. How about you, Amanda? Have you been? No, I have not. It is it is on my list as well. My yeah, There's something about, I, you know, when you talk about disconnecting, when you get on an airplane and you put your headphones on and you... And you and, and you're going international and you don't even have a Wi-Fi program yeah. that works, That that's when I feel like I disconnect. So if I can combine a long flight with, um, you know, a foreign country and the beach and the coast, I, I think that's that's it right now. And then Perfect. after I go there, it'll be another one. 
Yeah. But, uh, we still got a long, long time to live. Blue Spring yeah. Retreat 2023. Blue Spring Retreat <laughs> 2023 is not the Amalfi Coast. I yeah. promise you. It's probably, well, we can put a picture on the background and do yeah. a virtual destination. Yeah. Um, in uh, Orlando or Houston. <laughs> Lake, Lake Mary or, or Houston. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Jason, this has been a delight. Thank you so much uh, for for coming on and and talking to me and Andrew and uh, being on episode two of the of the podcast this season. Well, thanks for having me, and I hope you'll have me back. Of course. Yes, Thank you for course. joining. All right. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Bye. Bye. If you or someone you know is looking for some CEUs. Head over to bcbaceu.bluesprigautism.com and use the promo code PODCAST to get $5 off any CEU in the catalog. A link to the site can be found below in the description. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.